Right, so in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 through 3, it says this, Behold, I sent my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord, the Messiah, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger or angel of the covenant whom you desire. Behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts, but who can endure the day of his coming? Question mark. Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and he will purify the priest the sons of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver, and they may offer to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Now, that's like quite a mouthful, and I looked at that, and the first thing that I asked myself was, now, if he is like a refiner's fire, What is fuller soap? I mean, after a fire has purified something, what is there that's left? What do you need fuller soap now? What is this all about? And I was mostly intrigued to find out the process in the natural, how in those days, how it was done, how fuller soap came about. And uh, I did find a clip online uh, that shows um, the process in medieval times here in England. And um, the, the clip is by Tony Robinson, and it is hilarious. Well, he is quite funny anyway. But in, in that particular clip, which he enacts the process of what happens in the art of felting and fulling. Now, um, in this process of uh, felting and fulling, okay, uh, first of all, According to the dictionary, it is fulling is also known as tacking or walking. It's a step in woolen cloth making. Okay, I'll just give you a background so we understand. So you, you have wool and then it is, um, I forget the word now, you know, that it is made quite thin and it, woven. it is woven, right. So it, it, it is woven into cloth and then um, once it reaches uh, uh, the cloth stage, you know, there's a whole process and uh, that's where the clip actually shows what the cloth looks like after it's been woven. But it's quite frail, and it can tear at the edges. It needs to undergo a fulling process. Another word for it is felting process. And that felting process does two things. It eliminates the oil of the sebaceous glands of the sheep. The oil that is in the wool, remember this is wool, that has been woven into cloth. So the material will fray unless it goes through a felting process. And that felting process and fulling is done in this way. They, have, they put it in uh, tubs, and they use an 
ammoniac solution, something that is a very strong ammonia. Now, today you can go down and buy ammonia um, at a shop, you know, you can buy um, solutions easily. Back in the day, medieval times in England, um, and going back to Bible days, there wasn't a shop to go and buy the chemical. And for as gross as you might think it to be, they collected human urine and allowed it to uh, basically deteriorate, break down approximately two weeks, and then that substance was so strong and that together with the water and ash that they would bring, collect, then they would stand in this tub and walk it, walk on that material for eight hours, more or less. They'd walk it, they'd walk it. And they'd sing songs, this Scottish songs to the walk. Imagine that, you know, and I, I listened to one, it was hilarious, and people still celebrate the art, and they talk about it, and they enact these things. And so, after doing this, that material was made strong. We're getting somewhere. It would no longer be fray. It wouldn't fray at the edges. And then it would be put on tender hooks, a big fray, and stretched on these tender hooks. That's where the term on tender hooks comes from. And from that place, it would be strong, it would no longer fray, and now, once it was dry, it was absolutely clean, and it was pure, pure cloth. It smelled like fresh cloth, not the process. It didn't smell like the process that it had been through. And now, the best garments could be made from it. So, having understood that process, I then asked um, the Lord, you know, why refine this fire for the soap? And I began to see that the reason uh, for this fulling process and the fuller soap was to do one thing to that piece of cloth to remove the flesh oil and whiten this cloth, make it strong and make it of the best garments that you could make. This was the process for that cloth. Now, you know, if this was all like just Old Testament, you know, we could just like, okay, interesting history lesson. But then we see that in Mark, and I, let's read it, in Mark chapter um, 8, we see that um, Jesus in Mark chapter 9, we'll read it now, he goes up to the mountain with three of his disciples and reference there is made to his garments being white and becoming so bright as no fuller could make. So this immediately I began to see there's a process here. There's something more than just the art of laundry. The Word of God is pointing to something far deeper. So let's read in Mark 
8 from verse 34 where it says, And Jesus called to him the throng with his disciples and said to them, If anyone intends to come after me, let him deny himself. Hear this word, intends. If anyone intends, intends to come after me. I want to point out that how you follow Jesus, your intent of heart, your motive of heart are all very significant. Some followed Jesus for pure observation. Others followed Jesus because the crowd followed Jesus and their friends were caught up in the throng. So, hey, we go too. But Jesus says here, yeah, if anyone intends to come after me, that place of decision and intent in your heart, let him deny himself. In other words, you know, we cannot follow God not laying our life down. Earlier I said, an offering begins with our life being laid down. An offering isn't what comes out of our pocket. An offering begins with our life. And so he says, let him who denies himself, what, what does that mean? You lay down your life by forgetting, ignoring, disowning, losing sight of yourself and your own interests. Now there's the definition of how to lay down your life. You lay down your own interests, those things that are your own rights. And then it says further on, and take up his cross. Now, what does this word mean? Some people believe that, oh well, to take up my cross is to take up that which is so difficult uh, and punishment. No. Taking up your cross is exactly how Jesus did. What was the cross for Jesus? It was the purpose of his life. That's your cross. The purpose of your life. The purpose of your life begins with you hearing God, having the intent says, I give you every prayer of salvation starts with, I give you my life. Correct? <coughs> Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. At which point in time is it acceptable to take the life back? I give you my life. That means, according to Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, our life daily is then lived as a living sacrifice. We live for Him. The word is so clear, we know these scriptures, we bounce them around. In Him we live and move and have our being. But then, hey, that's a nice song, that's a nice verse from the Bible. And we do not live out of that knowledge that my former life is done with. It's dead. The life that I now live is Christ. I no longer live according to my own interests, my own impulses, what a desire. What I'm told is my rights and my deserves. I have to live my life to the glory of God. And that, when you determine to do that, you, it will become clear to you what your purpose is. 
And this is what Jesus says. Take up his cross, joining me as a disciple, siding with my party. Follow me, continually cleaving steadfastly to me. This is the amplified version. For whoever wants to save life will lose it. The lower natural temporal life which is lived only on earth and whoever gives up this natural temporal life which is lived only on earth for my sake and the gospels will save it. This higher spiritual life and will have the eternal kingdom of God. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life in the eternal kingdom of God? For what can a man give us as, as an exchange, a compensation, a ransom in return for his blessed life in the eternal kingdom of God? And remember, the kingdom of God is not going to begin. It is here. The blessing of God functions in the kingdom of God that is here, present right now. So as you lay your life down and you set aside all those things that are temporal value, you connect to the kingdom of God which is of eternal value and the blessing of God comes upon your life. For whoever is ashamed, here and now, of me and my words, in this adulterous, unfaithful, and preeminently sinful generation of him, will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory, splendor, and majesty of his Father with his holy angels. And this is what Jesus was teaching and then six days later in chapter 9 it says and Jesus said to them truly and solemnly I say to you there are some standing here who will no way taste death before they see the kingdom of God in its power okay Six days after this, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them and became resplendent with divine brightness. The King James says, and his garments were brighter than any fuller could make it. Note something here. He takes Peter, John and James up to the mountain and he is transfigured. He says this is the kingdom of God coming. Right there before their eyes he comes into his glory five state. Do you know that the day is coming closer and closer where in the twinkling of an eye we will be transfigured and caught up into the sky? Jesus didn't need fuller stuff. We need the process of fooling. And um, so when it speaks of what is this fuller soap? You know, the, um, in Hebrews, let me um, read it to you. In Hebrews chapter 5, 
we'll start in verse 7. It says there, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up definite special petitions for that which he not only wanted but needed, and supplications with strong cryings and tears to him who was always able to save him out from death, and he was heard because of his reverence towards God, his godly fear, his piety, in that he shrank from the horrors of separation from the bright presence of the Father. So, in the days of his flesh, he was praying, he was offering up vehement cries. He cried out to the Father. Was he crying out not to die? That wasn't it. He wasn't saying, oh, I'm so scared of going to the cross. No. His purpose was the cross. The discomfort for Jesus was that the horror of separation from the Father. Such was the holiness, the fear of the Lord in him, that the horror of separation from the Father. He cried out, he offered these prayers. And it says in verse 8, he was a son, yet he learned obedience through what he suffered. What did he suffer? Sickness? No. Do we need to suffer sickness? No. He suffered all sickness came upon his body. By his stripes we are healed. So it is a right of salvation and salvation includes healing to our bodies and so if we believe we are saved by the grace of God, so we receive the healing by the grace of God. So what was it that Jesus suffered? What was he learning in the days of his flesh? And I will get there. And it says in verse 9, and his completed experience, <coughs> making him perfectly equipped. He became the author and the source of eternal salvation to all those who give heed and obey him. Okay? And in another place, it says that he became our, our, our high priest. How does he become our high priest? Because here it says he learned obedience through that which he suffered. He completed his experience. He lived the experience of being human. He lived the experience of being betrayed. He lived the experience of being falsely accused. He lived the experience of getting tired and uh, working hard and uh, walking in a world did, that did not receive him. Yet did that stop him from speaking about the Father? Everything. It says there in John, Chapter 1, he came unto his own, but his own did not receive him. So Jesus lived through all these experiences and he became fully equipped to be our saviour. Reading on in verse 10, it says, being designated and recognized and saluted by God as high priest after the order 
with the rank of Melchizedek. And here I need to say something. The church reads this and just moves along. I don't understand that. Let's stick with that which we know. And so because we know about Levi and Aaron and the Old Testament priesthood and then we have 2,000 years um, and mostly there's a lot of understanding. Um, you know, there's the priest, you know, the Catholic understanding, there's the priest and most people come into Christianity having that sort of a frame of reference. There's the priesthood, there's, and then there's laity, and so we don't actually grasp the truth, the reality. And even 2,000 years later, with such good translations, so much study, we end up with a Christian church of those that are revived, okay? I'm not talking about the, those that are nominal and read out of the Reader's Digest and, you know, some nice poem. I'm talking about that, those that open the Bible but are stuck in a mindset that falls short of that which is the kingdom of God. So we have a lot of the church that has a mindset of church and not a mindset of kingdom. Mm, yeah. And we need to update our understanding because the priesthood of Jesus isn't according to what we understand, you know, the church uh, understands. It's according to the order of Melchizedek. And I'll tell you what the, wor the word Melchizedek means. And um, basically, Melchizedek means um, king of righteousness. And if you had to look at the Hebrew words, um, the... Each letter of the word Melchizedek means this, a royal one. So let's not just say it's kings, okay? Um, in Christ, there's neither male nor female. So let's just call it a royal one, all right? So Melchizedek is a royal one who overcomes the mayhem of this world by <coughs> speaking by speaking and depending on the power of God if you look at the each letter that makes up the word Melchizedek because you have yielded and surrendered to him through the door of the Spirit. In the word Melchizedek, each letter means something, and this is what it means. You are a royal one. You have overcome the mayhem of this world. You know, this world was not created to be like this, but when you receive Christ, and his kingdom. It's not about just Jesus come into my heart. It is Jesus come into my heart and I receive the kingdom of God. You are the king. Does the word not say he is the king of kings? Who are the kings? Am I not looking at them? So you have to get to the place that you realize I am a king. I'm a royal one. I've overcome 
the mayhem of this world. I've overcome all the torment of this world. I am translated into the kingdom of light. I am in the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God has dominion over everything that is of this world. And how does the kingdom of God have dominion? It says there in John chapter 5, 1 John uh, 5 verse 4, Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. I'll read that again. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So that Christian that turns around and says, my faith is weak. Maybe it's factual in that person's life. Well, the Bible says how your faith can get strong. Faith comes by hearing yeah. and hearing the word of God. Not nice little speeches. Not words of condemnation. Not words that are devoid of the word of God. So we have a responsibility to walk in the kingdom of God by the kingdom of God principles because that is what overcomes the world. The faith in us and our responsibility is that we depend on the power of God, not the knowledge of this world. So when we hear the word Melchizedek, Jesus is high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. There's a new order. And the church needs to align itself with this thinking that we need to speak. Melchizedek it, the, 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 the letter L, Lamed, is what you, you speak, what is connected between your brain and your mouth. I'm not giving you a Hebrew lesson. It's fascinating that every letter has a significance. So what you, the Lord gives you to speak from your word. It's not a luxury. You've got to speak it out. You've got to depend on the power of God. You've got to be yielded, surrendered to him and go through that door, the D, deck, okay, deck, through the door of the spirit. There is a way, the spirit way. It's not the earthly way, it's the spirit way. And the last letter, that Q, K, that sound, in the Hebrew, is the letter meaning of hope. So what is it that living in this kingdom does? It brings you out through this door of the spirit way to a living hope. A living hope. A living hope. A living hope, a living hope each day. So now let me get back to the fooling process. Each day, we face those things that are contrary to our faith and contrary to our faith. And they're in our face. Tough situations. Anybody here 
doesn't have those situations, huh? we would all like to, you know, be real. There ain't one of us. We all have these difficult things that may not even be, it's not our sin. I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about difficult things that are contrary to our faith, contrary to who we are in Christ. And whilst the refiner's fire deals with the inward man, the fire in the inward man, the fuller's soul deals with the outward man. It's not about our salvation. Say, not our salvation. Okay? We're saved. The refiner's fire is working. The fire of God deals with the inward man. But the fuller soul, that process, is dealing with our outward man. And what is it doing? Now let's go back to the natural things to understand natural things. In the fooling process, what we have is having to walk, having to walk. Does that sound familiar? I walk by faith. Okay? Sometimes there are those that are walking all over you, you know, and you go, ah, oh, this is not fair, but they're walking over you. Jesus, can't you see that so-and-so, this situation, it, it is so uncomfortable that I'm being walked all over here. What's it about, Lord? It's not comfortable, but I'm going to give you scripture for this. And there's that process going on. You don't realize it, but you are being made stronger. And that which is of the oil of your own skin. Okay? All of us are sheep. You got it? Okay? All, of, all sheep have sebaceous glands. Got it? Not one of us. So all of us have the capacity to excrete oil. And you know what that oil does on the garment of salvation? It makes us not be as bright. Our salvation is intact, don't get me wrong. But how we defend ourselves. Now I'm talking straight to the point. How we want to impose, uh, hey, this is my territory, my space. You know, even to, at the cost, of humility. You know, enforcing ourselves in situations or not speaking what we should because, hey, I speak up now, it's going to come against me. All those situations that are part of our natural lives, Jesus is very aware of them. And he wants to minister to us at that level. He wants to go and touch that brokenness. 
because he doesn't want us to fray at the edges. He wants to take that which is the brokenness of this world, the brokenness of our lives, to make us strong. To bring the brightness of his glory into our life. Do you get this point? In um, Psalm, I'll read Psalm, gosh, time has run away. Um, Psalm 66. Verse 12, it says, You caused men to ride over our heads when we were prostrate. Mm -hmm. We went through fire and through water, but you brought us out into a broad, moist place to abundance and refreshment and an open air. The Hebrew word in, in the, um, um, you know, King James, it says it differently. It says you brought us out. So you caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire. We went through water. But you brought us out into a wealthy place. And that word um, wealthy in the Hebrew Revaya actually means this. You brought us out into rich fulfillment. You brought us out into satisfaction. You satiated us. We got soaked. We call ourselves the river. And here's the truth. To be able to soak in the river of God, we have to allow God to remove our natural oil. Okay? That which we naturally, our own, that which is to save our skin. The sheep produces oil to save his own skin. You realize that. It's a natural process. But that natural process of saving your own skin also prevents you from soaking the river in. Such a simple truth. How does it work? The fuller soap, the fooling process where God works in our life to make us stronger, to brighten us as we allow Him to stop that saving of ourselves. Let Him be your defender. The foulest mouths get to the place that they can't open against you. Um, a testimony of this woman whose husband uh, was just absolutely abusive. Not a Christian, extremely abusive. And she got touched by God in a, in a meeting and totally drenched in the river of God. She was drunk in the spirit. And she still goes home in that state of being, the English word is satiated, totally drenched in that living water. She got home like half past twelve at night. She's coming through the door. 
and he's ready to have a powwow with her, except that Jesus in her at that moment zapped him. And between the step where he was going to open his mouth and the next step of him falling to the ground, he had gotten born again and what had come out of him was him talking in tongues. I share that testimony. It's true testimony to encourage all the ladies whose husbands are not sitting next to them. He can do it. He will do it. You get satiated in the water of God. Whatever it is, as the River Church here in Yates, we need to understand we're to be a church after the order of Melchizedek. Yes. Kings and priests. <clears throat> there are many churches out there that do not understand it, do not practice it. But in this place, we need to know who we are and we need to come ready to soak, soak the living water. Our level of hunger has to rise. I, I shared this testimony and I'm going to close with this. Some years ago, the Lord gave me a vision. And in this vision, um, I was looking and there was a stream and the water was running about this deep. Streams normally run this deep, right? Very crystal clear. And I could see the fish. And then the fish were multiplying. And the level of water remained. But the fish were multiplying. And now I started to panic. Because the fish was multiplying and there wasn't enough water. And I started to cry out to God and said, Lord, there's not enough water. We need more water. Because the fish are multiplying and there isn't enough water. And I began to intercede. And there began to be lightnings coming from heaven and striking the stream. And all of a sudden, the river rose. And the fish were multiplying like a kettle was boiling and the river was just about keeping up to that level and the fish growing and the water and the water. And all of a sudden, the fish weren't fish. They were people's faces. Let this not be a church where the river runs this deep. And you know what causes the river to flow? Hunger. Hunger for the presence. Allowing God to deal with those areas in our life where we are, hey, this is my territory. This is my thing. Hey, you've walked on my toes. Hey, hey, you know, self-preservation. Saving your own skin. God wants to make us tight. And we need to be soaked with his presence. When we give an opportunity for those that want prayer, we all know that we are invited to live as a 
a living sacrifice. You know, on an altar, the ash has to be removed in order for the fire to burn. And you know that. We cannot keep the ashes of yesterday's moves of God. It's not enough. We've got to clean the altars of our life and set those ashes aside and allow God to do a fresh work in us. Those that want me to pray for you this morning, just raise your hand so I can see who you are. Father, I thank you for every person who has raised their hand. And I thank you, Jesus, that you are like a refiner's fire and like full of soap. And I thank you, Lord, that you will walk in the midst of your church. In the same way that in the book of Revelation, you walked among the candlesticks and you spoke to the church. Lord, I pray that you walk in our midst. Come as a refiner's fire, come as fuller's son, and cleanse out of our lives and of our midst all that prevents us from the river rising. We pray, Father, that in this place, the glory of God will not be contained, but expressed. Father, we ask you for the salvation of the lost in this area. And Father, I pray that you prepare us as a place where they can come to be touched by you. We don't want a church that is uh, good enough for people. We want a church that is good enough for you. The type of church that you are welcome and delight in. Lord, we want your kingdom come and your glory in our midst. And so, Father, as we go into this week, I pray you touch every heart and you remind each one, work in us a work. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And it all started with soap from Israel.